special evening planned this evening. Um, I'd like to call this meeting to order. We do have uh, board members in the audience. We wanted the focus to be on the students this evening, not us. We'll be here a little later on. Um, what I have for roll call, I see Mrs. Dow, I see Mrs. Zahn, I see Mrs. Alvin, Mr. Padme, and myself. Am I missing anyone? Um, myself, Mrs. Alvin. We have other board members who are on their way. It is a little bit tight for them. We have a lot of board members who work and have young children, and I already have gotten some calls, and they are on route. So um, with that, I ask you to please stand. First up is uh, Brendan Sullivan from Fairfield Woods. Come on up, Brendan. <laughs> Brendan is an outstanding citizen who consistently demonstrates high academic achievement year after year at Fairfield Woods. He is often coming to the aid and helping friends who are in who are in need. In fact, Brendan makes a point to reach out to some of our most needy students in the school, whether it's with a high five, or a hello in the hallway, or helping them with their homework. He's a genuine person and shows compassion for everyone. As part of a community service organization called the Torch Club at Wakeman, he works with younger children organizing games and activities. He's also very active in his church youth group and community basketball teams. We are very proud of friends. Next is Char 
Charlotte Chuinsky. Charlotte? Charlotte is an excellent student who is very active in her school's leadership council as well as the basketball team. In fact, Charlotte is the only student in her current eighth grade class that received straight A's in every quarter of every year at Fairfield High School. She's involved in her community, volunteering at the Audubon Society, the local library, and is the captain of her Relay for Life team. She also plays travel soccer and on some of the community basketball leagues. She serves as a counselor to younger students at, uh, in the summer at Bible camp, and we are also extremely proud of all of her accomplishments. Roger Ludlow Middle School, Mr. Dapino, thank you. Last year, Eleanor was a member of the school level board, which was a group who traveled to Africa to help build the school and raise money for various supplies. Eleanor was an integral part of our fundraising effort for that project. She is also very involved with her church, where she sings in the choir and is a counselor in the Vacation Bible School. Eleanor also enjoys participating in ballet school and playing tennis. She is very intelligent, motivated, and a focused student. Her stellar performance and achievements in her class attest to her ability, effort, and engagement. She is a positive influence on others and a fine role model for all. Her good humor, tolerance, and kindness are among the qualities that make her well respected by her peers and teachers. And we're very pleased and proud to nominate you for this award. Congratulations. <laughs> Anthony also contributes to our community by volunteering at local events such as the Enchanted Castle in Fairfield. He has served food at local homeless shelters and he serves communion at his church. Anthony was selected as a student mentor in our school character education program. As a member of the character education program, he teaches our sixth grade students the importance of respectfulness, responsibility, perseverance, tolerance, and many other positive characteristics. <coughs> Anthony is a team player and a leader in the athletic environment as well. This is evidence on his basketball, lacrosse, and football teams. Anthony is committed to his education and athletics, and he faces challenges head on. Congratulations, Anthony. Thank you. It's really interesting watching the, face of the high, faces of the high school administrators because they're thinking, Freshman in my school next year. <laughs> Tomlinson Middle School. Please welcome Meredith Pelosa. <laughs> Meredith did not grow up, if you consider 13 grown up, in Fairfield. She moved to Fairfield from Virginia and decided, in her words, to let go of the previous seven years. In order to assimilate into her new home, <coughs> Meredith became involved in soccer, the drama club, and Tomlinson's chamber choir. Meredith feels a strong sense of commitment to each of these groups, never missing a practice. 
In a recent article in Educational Leadership, the author wrote about those who, quote, lead from behind. I believe this is Meredith's style of leadership, actively participating in her academics through group work that allows her to use her people skills, all of which her teachers have noted. She enjoys the exchange of ideas that comes from differing opinions, and the project that started out as a school assignment becomes so much more. Meredith is entirely dependable, cheerful, and outgoing, and she sets a wonderful example for her peers. Although she may describe some of the decisions she has made as difficult ones, that doesn't show on the outside. She's an excellent student, a well-rounded individual, and a leader who shows others the way by simply and consistently doing her best and honestly just being who she is. Congratulations. <laughs> and also from Tomlinson, Cooper Schwab. has had several opportunities to hone his leadership skills, most notably on the basketball court. His ability to lead his peers goes beyond the average middle school basketball player, however, because of the way in which he thinks about leadership. Cooper says that his motivation comes from, quote, influencing positive outcomes in a manner where people feel both confident and content. He says that people should feel good about their efforts, regardless of the outcome. He demonstrates respect, whether it be for the game, the referees, or the other team. Cooper's strong work ethic has resulted in an excellent academic record, as well as an athletic one. He describes himself, himself as having a mental toughness regarding his schoolwork. I believe his positive attitude is contagious, <coughs> and a strong component of his style of leadership. Cooper has also served his community through participation in hands-on activities, such as assisting the elderly and raising funds for the homeless and the hungry. Cooper feels most content when the whole team and every member of it experiences success. Congratulations, Cooper. Thank you, Dr. Clark. I'd like to recognize two of my colleagues that came this evening to congratulate our students as well. Um, Mr. John Honey, representing our teacher ranks, and Mr. Joe Blake, our Webster Housemaster. <laughs> Please join me in congratulating Matt Fitchberg. When we look to nominate students for this award, we look for our all-around outstanding students, and Matt certainly exemplifies that. Matt is an outstanding academic student as well as athlete and leader among our students. He's completed five AP classes over his uh, tenure with us at Fairfield Ludlow High School with a GPA of 4.03. He's a member of both the National Honor Society and the Spanish Honor Society. His athletic accomplishments, including playing on the varsity team for tennis for all four years, and this year being selected by his coaching uh, teammates as captain of the varsity tennis team. Matt also is engaged in volunteer work outside of our school. He works at the Wakeman Boys and Girls Club and is a member of our key club, sponsoring many of the food drives and holiday donations. He's also co-captain this year for our Relay for Life team for Youth Against Cancer. Matt was selected by his uh, administrators and teachers for the St. Michael's Book Award in his junior year. He also spent a week this past summer at Georgetown for the American Political Politi I'm sorry, American Politics and Political Affairs Program, 
and was selected by that group as MVP of the Democratic Ad Committee Group. He will be our next senator from Connecticut. <laughs> We really want to congratulate Matt. We know he'll do a great job uh, as he will be attending the University of Michigan next year. Congratulations. <laughs> and also join me in congratulating Linja Jot. As the students at Fairfield Ludlow say, if you want to know what's going on in our school, just ask Linja. She knows it all. She knows whether there's a meeting after school or whether the homework's due or whether there's a test tomorrow. Again, one of our outstanding students academically. Linja completed four AP classes in her junior year and five advanced placement courses in her senior year with a GPA of 4.28. She skipped Latin 41 and enrolled in AP Latin as a senior and received the Summa Cum Laude Award on the National Latin Exam. Linja is a member of five national honor societies at our school. Outside of school, she's also very engaged as a principal flautist for the Greater Bridgeport Youth Orchestra and has volunteered over 200 hours at a local hospice uh, over the past three years. Lynch is also engaged in what happens at our school, serving as Vice President of the Student Representative Council, Founder and President of the Biology Club, and this year serving as President of the National Honor Society. What makes Linja extra special to us? She arrived in the United States from China in the sixth grade without speaking a word of English. She spent her first two years in our English as a Second Language program at Fairfield Public Schools, and within four years was taking the Advanced Placement Language and Composition course. Her counselor uses these words, which I quote to you from her college recommendation. Linda, Linda seeks to combine the benefits of both the Chinese education framework of hard work and high scores with the American education practices focusing on self-discovery and independent thinking. We look forward to hearing about Linda's success in the future as she will be attending New York University next year. I'd like to introduce to you uh, one of the finest people at Fairfield Board High School, James Sabina. Uh, those of you who have spent any time at Fairfield Board have heard the, uh, our acronym and our core values that the board stands for a welcoming, academic, respectful, dynamic, and ethical environment. And uh, last year, our faculty chose James as a winner of the Ward Medal for the student who best embodies the core values of Fairfield Ward. So as we uh, sought among the many students to select for this distinguished honor today, uh, one of the things that came up right away was uh, we've got somebody walking around here who embodies our school. Uh, that is James Salina. His work in the classroom has been outstanding uh, this year when we hosted the uh, DHS Visiting Committee for our Accreditation, James was a natural choice to serve as one of our student ambassadors who uh, toured the, the visitors throughout our school explaining every aspect of the welcoming, academic, respectful, dynamic, and ethical environment. He uh, not only represented us quite well there, but the Fairfield community is very lucky to have him uh, with his uh, work with the uh, Wake and Voice Club particularly the Keystone operation. He was selected this year 
uh, as one of 10 students nationally to play in the national uh, convention. His uh, community service has been uh, remarkable in all aspects of uh, not only his school life, but beyond school. He serves as a uh, volunteer percussion teacher for uh, underprivileged students in Bridgeport. Uh, he has uh, toured uh, with musical groups, uh, raising money as far away as Italy uh, for earthquake relief, and has been a uh, ready volunteer throughout. Uh, he's committed uh, to our school in many ways as a member of our basketball team for four years. And uh, those of you who have uh, wondered about the Battle of the Houses, well, James is a prime mover in the Battle of the Houses, having uh, been the chief organizer uh, for last year's battle and uh, this year's as well. Um, I could not be prouder to have a student of James Calvin represent our school in the many ways he has. And we look forward to great things for James at the University of Michigan. Congratulations. <laughs> Uh, the board meeting is due to start uh, at 7.30, and so I'm going to have to reduce my remarks on Alana, otherwise we'd be here till about 9. <laughs> Summarizing all of her accomplishments and uh, the many reasons that we are so proud to have her as a member of our graduating class this year. Uh, I guess the first thing I want to tell you is um, that Alana has educated me and introduced me to a, a new activity uh, called flocking. You all know what flocking is? Well, Alana uh, invented flocking as a uh, fundraising activity, uh, leaving pink flamingos on uh, lawns throughout their <laughs> That's you. <laughs> So, Alana, I didn't know if that was like a secret activity or not. <laughs> I did happen to see it on an activity. So, anyway, that uh, raises money for uh, uh, cancer research and awareness, and uh, Alana has been uh, very involved in that. She is uh, an outstanding student, as one might expect, a four-year member of our honor roll. Uh, and a, uh, just an outstanding student in every way. Uh, her school activities, of course, involve Key Club, our Interact Club, our Focus uh, newspaper. Uh, she's a four-year member of our ice hockey team, a uh, three-year varsity player on our lacrosse team, a member of the Darien ice hockey team, a member of the Bridgeport ice hockey club, uh, and most importantly to me, a volunteer <coughs> teaching kids at state. Uh, I'm not quite sure how she fits all that in with flocking and everything else going on. <laughs> uh, she, uh, she is an uh, exceptional musician. Uh, as uh, her fellow recipient tonight, James, a uh, member of our music program, uh, Alana is in our chamber singers, is in our wind ensemble, and somehow is also in our symphonic orchestra. So uh, I'm not exactly sure she's actually able to sing and play uh, the string instruments at the same time, but she somehow manages to be in all three groups and is a member of the Connecticut chapter of the American Park Society. So uh, this is an outstanding musician and uh, also has been working as a waitress on Saturdays and Sundays. So, <laughs> You tell me how she does it, um, but I can attest to the fact that she does it. And we could not be more proud of Alana, and uh, James Madison University is very, very lucky.
very, very, very proud of you. We are lucky to be able to have you in our schools, and we wish you great success. And we did a very, very fond farewell to our seniors and hope to
to change it. Um, okay, that's fine. I, I still wouldn't be supporting this, um, given that I haven't seen any new information, and I do believe that many people that would be interested in the item um, wouldn't be here this evening, as Mrs. Ayacono said. Thank you. Mr. Luke? I, I would just like to say one last time that um, I think uh, the last meeting that we were at, we had a large majority of the public came here. There was support for it. I might think most people felt that, that was going to be an evening that it was either going to pass or not pass. Um, we have an opportunity now to do something with this. And the verbiage has not changed but, but by two words. Um, we have the time now that the budget is not on the agenda tonight. I would ask at least, at the very least, that you vote to put this on the agenda so we can spend a little bit of time looking at it. And if you still feel that it is not ready for you to vote on it tonight, then you still have that opportunity to say pass. But um, I think this is a really important uh, policy, and I'd like to see it because I believe that the superintendent and the administration are going to go, if it passes, go all out to try to get this done so that we can have it for our dances, for our dances this year. And I think that says a lot to what, how they feel about it. Any further discussion for more members? Mr. Kerr? So, uh, through the chair, to Mr. Lou, is there intent to actually implement this policy within three days with this motion? The administration. The administration. I'll actually let Dr. Clark speak to this. Mr. Carey raises a really good point. I'm not sure we'd be able to get enough grant licenses to do it within three days. Both headmasters and their housemasters here, I'm not sure we'd be able to do that. And I'm not sure how comfortable they would feel with that because it's a complete change of policy and we haven't been able to advise the students. So, I understood the conversation we had last to this point on the motion. I believe council was telling us that noticing is an important point of this conversation. And I thought one of the key reasons why we were not moving forward at the time was that we had to decide the window in two weeks. So considering the window is now three days, I don't see how that situation is improved. And I would like to not to go in there. Tom? Additionally, if I recall um, the first time we looked at the policy, it was a bit about training uh, faculty for administering the test. I don't know how long that uh, training would go, but again, within the three day time frame to train, um, again, I don't know the specifics of the training, but it might seem problematic. Thank you. Um, actually, I, I think maybe because we haven't, you know, promotion. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that this is just to put it on the agenda. I do think there are some serious questions here to answer Mr. Carey's question that, you know, I'm not going to try to ram this down if we do not feel that it is something that the administration feels that they can do in time. I had thought that this was something that there was a possibility that, that they might be, but I might be wrong about that. But all I'm asking at this point is to get on the agenda so we can discuss it further. If we have no further comments then from board members, I'll invite the public if they wish to address this amendment to put it on the agenda. Vivian O'Shaughnessy, Queens Grant Road. I ask that you do put this on the agenda tonight to discuss it. At the policy committee meeting, the administration said they're for this. Uh, the students have been noticed. From promise. Actually, I have two students at Level High School, and they both are wondering why board of ed didn't pass the policy. They're expecting to be breathalyzed. Uh, the students fully expect it. The administration has talked with them, so they have had notices on the prompt promise, which parents have to sign, so they have received notice. Uh, so I ask that you do put this on the agenda tonight and perhaps talk with the administrators in the building see if they can uh, meet the, the timeline. 
been ten speaking to the same issue, the idea of uh, tonight um, adding once again more discussion and hopefully a vote to get rent lenders um, into into our proms. Uh, as you know, rentalizing is been done, has been done in our proms. And I'd also like to hear comments if you choose not to make this vote uh, motion, uh, to go with the motion tonight, discuss and to vote enact this policy immediately. I don't understand what will be done in our prompts. Um, so you're asking our administrators then, I'm assuming, to go ahead and use breathalyzer strips without a policy, um, without your approval, based on their subjective views of what the kids look like as they come in. There is no document. I've asked for a document on how their, the administrators are to assess. Uh, how these kids look, there's no document, there's no consistency. Um, if you're worried about um, rights, consistency, uh, and uh, notice, it seems to me she'll be worried about fairness. Um, the note, the prom promise has included this year notification to answer your question. I don't understand why more of the members have not seen information from the policy committee that happened last week. Um, I know what happened there. I don't know why you don't know what happened there. Um, and lastly, there are devices that can be had, and they are available at two ninety nine each, and there is no training. It's like using a thermometer. It's that easy. They're used in Greenwich High School in Heaven, which is huge. And I also ask our high school administrators um, to comment at this point if they disagree with what they're hearing, because I heard from them at the policy committee that they could do it. Would you please come in? I, I believe if the administrators would like to address them, we can have them come up. But um, I will defer to Dr. Clark on this. I, 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 I think it would depend on whether or not you wanted to put those on the agenda. That's my procedural question. Yes, Mr. Um, Mr. Carey has asked to put it on the agenda. Is it on the agenda? Is he offering a motion that he would like to add to the agenda or a discussion? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Lou, my apologies. Um, is it a motion or is it a discussion item? If it's a discussion item, we wouldn't have anything other than a discussion. No, it is, so it's a motion to put it on with the, with the possibility, with the ability to vote on whether or not we want to, to approve the yes. Thank you. Do you need to offer the motion? to offer a motion that I'd like to offer a motion. You'd like to, you need to offer that you want to add to the agenda a motion to deal with the issue of breathalyzer and the language for the motion. Otherwise, yeah. you're offering just a discussion which does not include the possibility of a vote. Okay, so I would like to offer a motion to put it on the agenda for approval uh, that we put out our breathalyzer policy on the agenda Thank you. And thank you, Mrs. Elvin. Um, I think then, since we have no further comment from the public, we'll bring it back to the board. If there's no further comment from the board members, again, we need a two thirds vote. Mr. Carey, did you want to? I have a procedural question, I guess. Does anyone have a right to get understand that the person who said that uh, on the one hand, I don't have a problem discussing this group. Um, on the other hand, though, if I understand what we're doing, we can have a discussion about the district group for an hour or two in the meeting. And then without any notice to the public, one member can say we're going to redistrict the town. The two-thirds of the members of this board can say yes, we can do it, we can start this tonight. Is that the precedent we're setting or am I missing something? I don't think it's a precedent, Mr. Carey. It actually is part of the rules. That's why it requires, instead of a majority, it actually requires two-thirds of the board to actually put something in item on the agenda in that same evening. In fact, there was something done like that not that long ago. It was this past fall. It was actually about an H1N1 policy. It has been done. Um, it's not common practice, but again, it takes two-thirds of this body to do it. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, Mr. Matola? The only thing I, I would say is, normally when you have a motion like this, and that's on the agenda, it's, it's, it's not something of this magnitude. It's something 
where we have to get business done because we're, we're up against the deadline. So this is the Okay, if we're all set, then I will ask members if they are in favor of this motion to put this item on the agenda for discussion and a vote. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. On the people in favor, Mr. Wu, Mrs. Dow, and myself, and voting against are Mr. Matolo, Mrs. Zahn, Mrs. Iacono, Mrs. Alba, Mr. Carey, and Mr. Fabi. Thank you. Now moving on to our moment of pride. I know there's an other appointment. Sorry. I didn't have my glasses on. I apologize. We have to, Mr. Toll appointed out. We have to hire someone. We have another recommended motion that the Board of Education approve the appointment of a teacher with the Fairfield Public Schools effective July 1, 2010, with the assignment as coordinator of early childhood special education. Um, Mrs. Zahn, second to mine. Mrs. Dow. Thank you. And Ms. Leonardi is going to do the introductions. Thank you. Good evening. Um, first, I'd just like to say how excited I am to be here representing a committee of individuals representing parents, staff members, administration, building administration, and central office to introduce to you Kristen Dow. Um, I do have committee members here. If I could ask them to stand and, and thank them for their service. They were outstanding. <laughs> they worked incredibly hard over many hours to identify and coalesce around what the needs of the Early Childhood Center were and were in agreement and consensus along the way. Um, we met with, with families, we met with staff members of all different um, arenas, uh, and they really had a consensus about what we needed um, in the Early Childhood Center leadership. And Kristen met every single one of those standards. Um, as we discussed and, and talked with her through the interview process, we found her to be energetic and really um, has the potential to be a transformational leader for us. So we are excited. Um, and we look forward to July 1st when we can celebrate her um, taking over the Early Childhood Center and helping us move into the next, the next iteration of the Early Childhood Center. So with that, I introduce to you Kristen Downs. Um, 
we have recognition of Rachel, Rachel Finlaw, Kirka Lego High School student who won the state scholastic art gold key award and gold award at the national level for her photograph, Portrait of Elsa, which I hope most of you can see we placed in a place we thought um, we would have a good chance to uh, take a peek. Rachel and her photography teacher, Michelle Herson, will each be presented with a medal by the National Scholastics Board at Carnegie Hall. And I thought, um, are you going to present this? Come on up, please. I'd actually like to invite the her sister Sarah here to join in and award her sister yeah. Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we have the K-12 art coordinator, Ms. Barbara Pollock here. In, um, she would like to stand with them too. This, this is a great event. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Michelle Herbson, and I've been teaching art and photography in the Fairfield Public Schools for the past 15 years. And tonight, I'm here to introduce and honor a 10th grade student named Rachel Finlaw, who did that beautiful portrait that you see on the stage. This year, Rachel's photograph, Elsa, has been recognized by the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers as one of the top pieces in the nation. Rachel will be awarded a National Gold Medal for, for her artistic achievement. Putting it into perspective, 100 and 165,000 entries were considered nationwide. 1,400 of those pieces were recognized as the best teen artworks in the nation and 500 out of those 1,400 were given a gold medal. The students receiving these medals are considered the most accomplished teen artists of 2010. Other, teen, other teens who have received this prestigious award include Andy Warhol, <laughs> Richard Abaddon, Robert Redford, and now Rachel Finlaw. <laughs> Rachel's teacher, I too am lucky enough to receive a medal as an accomplished teacher and mentor. Rachel, her family, and I will be attending a two-day event in New York City. We will be honored with the medals on June 9th at Carnegie Hall. Rachel's work will then be exhibited at the World Financial Center during the summer months. This is really cool, right? <laughs> Rachel is not only a student of mine, but a product of the Fairfield Public School System. She represents the many students who have benefited from one of the finest, from one of the finest art programs in the state of Connecticut, and maybe even the country. I'm confident that Rachel's natural talent and potential was reached in part because of the, the support given to her by the Fairfield Public School. Rachel moved to this state just a few years ago, and her mother said to me, Kathy, over there, <laughs> your sister right here, that before she moved to Fairfield, she never knew Rachel had any artistic talent. <laughs> <laughs> this may be a life-changing moment for her. Rachel found her passion. Not only has she made her parents proud, but she's made her teachers and school system proud as well. Please help me to congratulate this deserving students on this superb accomplishment. teacher every year has students win awards at both the state and national level and there are two pieces of work with awards one um, from the Department of Motor Vehicles on behalf of organ donors that her students have done so yes we have a very talented student and we have a very talented and hardworking teacher.
thin photos are very important. Mrs. Elvin, do you wish to speak? Yes, I can have a moment of personal privilege. Um, following the discussion from um, our prior item and the issue of the proms, safety, and um, and what the board is looking at, could I ask uh, through the administration, I, I know that they're already doing this, but in an effort to um, address some of the concerns, perhaps from some of the parents, that um, that we ensure or assure the parents that both at Fairfield Ludlow High School and Fairfield Ward High School that the headmasters are clearly explaining to the students um, both in the assemblies that they hold through the prom promise letter whether or not it needs to be revised at all to properly reflect what you would be doing and perhaps letter perhaps a letter home to the parents that will clearly explain what you will be doing and how you will be handling these dances um, in the event, you know, in the absence of any other policies from the board. Um, that certainly would satisfy our, um, our notice to the parents and it would, first of all, set some fears aside. Secondly, it would convey the message from the district what they are doing, which provides notice for um, legal purposes, as we've been told. So if we could have some assurances that that would be done, um, I mean, I know they do that. I know that the headmasters meet with the students now, but if we can know what they're doing so that the parents know, and if it's a letter home to the parents uh, before this Saturday's prom, it will clearly state what they can anticipate. And um, to Dr. Clark, and again, I, I believe some of that I know I've already signed the prom promise and I'm not well aware, so please um, thank you for your suggestion. I would also support, because I do know that when past administrations and, and um, high school administrators have imposed consequences and stiff ones, it sent a very strong message. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda, we have approval of minutes. We have the recommended motion of the Board of Education to the minutes of education business meeting of April 27, 2010. Mrs. is on, seconded by the Mrs. Um, thank you. Any comments from board members? All in favor of the minutes? Passes to Paul, Mr. Fuzzy. Thank you. Passes to Thank you. Next time on the agenda, we have public comments and petitions. During this period, the board will hear comments and receive petitions from any citizen present at the meeting. Any single presentation must be limited to two minutes. An audiovisual equipment cannot be used without the advanced authorization of the chair. The board will not hear comma on any good fit for little, little I have a one night on no. On individual personal matters for comments addressed specific see, specific members of the board. Citizens are asked to comment on any voting item at the time the item is under consideration by the board. Would anyone like to address the body? Thank you. Nancy Church, Amy Fleming Lane. On behalf of the PTAs at Fairfield Ward High School and Fairfield Logo High School, I would like to read a letter that was delivered to each of you via the um, central office two weeks ago. I hope you've had an opportunity to read it. Dear Ms. Fitzpatrick, Dr. Clark, and members of the Board of Education, we are writing to express the disappointment felt by the Fairfield Board and care for local high school PTAs regarding the new vending machines installed in the cafeteria. As you, I hope, are aware, 20% of our students are unable to partake in the scheduled lunch period in the cafeteria. We were under the impression that these new vending machines would allow them and other students to eat healthy lunch and snack that they otherwise couldn't due to their schedules. We were told that these machines 
would house sandwiches, wraps, and salad choices, but also fruit, vegetables, and other healthy lunch options. Instead, what we are seeing is snacks with minimal nutritional value that don't represent a healthy lunch option and undermine the important lessons regarding nutrition and healthful eating as taught in your health curriculum and at home. These machines should provide the students with yogurts, fruit salads, and raw vegetables, whole grain crackers and cheese, a whole grain cereal bowl, or more healthy options and protein bars. However, they are given options such as Pop-Tarts, Cocoa Puff cereal bars, and Rice Krispie treats that are heavily processed and full of high fructose corn syrup. These are empty calories that will not only fail to help them function throughout the day, but will actually interfere with their ability to concentrate in class. These preclude us from striving toward our goal of combating the obesity epidemic. We as parents and as a district think that these are unacceptable options for our children. Our nurses report that they are treating an inordinate number of students with headaches because they drink coffee all day and do not eat. These vending machines are an opportunity for us to offer them healthy alternatives. We feel that this opportunity has been missed. As DTA has me, I'm sorry, Mrs. Church, we have a two we have a two minute time limit. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have presentation. First read of policy number 3270.1, gifts. This is on the agenda. Mr. would you want to address it? Good evening. The um, policy for grant uh, 3270.1 is recommended for revision by several individual board members. So we have presented to you uh, in front of you the first three highlights several areas where the changes are made. And the one to try to make the policy more specific, highlighting a uh, gift except for $500 uh, requires the approval of not just the administration, but very specific of the administration. That is, they had to the principal of simple office the administration and before the acceptance of the gift. Then all gifts uh, after acceptance may be reallocated between schools, among schools, to remedy a clear education inequity on recommendations of the simple and of education. So there are actually three pieces here. Number one, the value. Number two, that they have to be accepted by the principal, headmaster, or central office administrator, and then it gives the superintendent the ability to reallocate uh, gifts to schools when there is a clear inequity based on the kind of presentation. Thank you, Mr. Boyne. Thank you, Mr. Boyne. Do you have a question? I didn't know okay. I'm sorry that I didn't mean to Perhaps 
ask you to change the language to headmaster or headmaster or principal in um, conjunction with central office administrator. I mean, someone who knows the whole district needs to be involved in the decision so that we can ensure um, that it's equitable. Ms. Zachary. Thank you. I, I agree it should be headmaster principal and central office administrator, or however you want to grammatically phrase it. But, um, can't be done in isolation, but that's not how you're stating it here. Um, my question is around the red line for, um, where, you, where you red line from PTA students, public spirited citizens, and or corporations. Um, what, what was your reasoning for redlining that? Because I, personally, it's my experience that the, the, the people, the very people you're highlighting, even though I'm thinking you're maybe cut it out because it's obvious, you're stating the obvious, but quite frankly, I don't think the obvious understand that they're part of that group. Otherwise, I, I prefer to be the world subcommittee to help draft this. Uh, Thank you. Sure, I'm just not, I don't understand why you've redlined the, um, it says all gifts and equipment, blah, 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 offered to the Board of Education from PTA students, public spirited citizens, and or corporations. How? Well, I think the rationale that I think uh, was considered was that it was any gift, it didn't matter where it came from, uh, and you may exclude some people on that list that you maybe should include. So it's not an all encompassing list. There may be other entities in town so I didn't think there was, or I think the thought was it wasn't a need to get there as long as it was sort of full of water. I see totally what you're saying, but I think it is important to understand because, quite frankly, I don't think these people, I, I, I don't think they understand that, I think the PTAs think they're exempt from this. And I think if you outline specifically name some of these groups, I would rather see, or I would recommend language that says, and or other entities that are, you know, discretion or something like that, you know, adding in the other piece rather than taking this out. But I mean, maybe I'm reading too much into this. I don't know. Um, and then I just thought the other piece that you added, at all gifts after acceptance may be allocated between schools only to remedy clear educational inequities upon recommendation by the superintendent and approval by the board. Um, this is where I totally miss um, Ms. Dodson because I just don't think the language on that is clear and I that she would have been able to rewrite that. Um, it, um, I don't know. It seems like there's a misplaced Participle or something like that. Not a very good English speaker, anyone? <laughs> um, if that language is important to Mrs. Iacona, I would think that uh, having, in, having a value in excess of $500 off to the Board of Education, including but not limited to from, excuse me, from PTAs, but you, we could get that's wrong with that language. But my, my question, I guess, you know, the concern is I'm, I'm really for taking whatever we can get. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think the way this reads is that if we have like an outstanding gift that's being offered to a school, but someone determines that it may cause an educational inequity, we're not going to accept that. Um, I think that what, what we, so, so I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's the intent, but that's how I read it. Um, I think if we have an outstanding gift that is being made, that we should tell the, the gifter, which is the person who's giving the gift that, we appreciate what you're doing, but please be clear that once you, you, you give us the gift, it may be distributed um, to various schools, so you know, we are offering an equitable program to, to everyone. So 
that, that's, that's my concern. Um, I think if we accept something and we find that it's it's giving one or two schools an advantage, then we can fix that problem. And the language of this policy allows us to do so. But the way I read this right now, there's a real possibility that um, you know, school, Jenny School, where my son goes, for example. I know five, six years ago, we held a big fundraiser and we were able to buy all, pretty much all the overhead projectors for that particular school. I think at, at, at that time, the Jennings had an advantage. I, I don't know, maybe they did uh, that particular year, but in, in, in reality, it helped the entire district because resources that may have been allocated for Jennings the next year, the year after, by those projectors went somewhere else. So, I mean, that's, that's the concern I have. So, is it the intent of this policy to, act, to actually refuse a gift if at the time we feel, or the administration feels, it's, it, it causes an inequity? That's my question. And I don't know if you can answer it. That is directed to me. I can bring more members who suggested this policy. And I'm one of them, and it was never the intent um, at all. I, I agree with you. What I think, at least I know I saw, was we're hit, hitting tough economic times. And when we do, you know, people naturally look for alternative sources, and gifts will become more of an issue. Um, and I think, as a board, we have a responsibility to make sure that whatever is going on in the district, we are providing equitable resources. So we wanted to be clear as we move forward that as much as we are thrilled and greatly appreciate the gifts, that also we still have a responsibility. I believe this is now. One question, one statement. Question, where it says all gifts after acceptance may be reallocated. Are we talking about only those in excess of $500 or all gifts, even if then there are $50 gift? I believe. Uh, Talking about gifts in excess. Okay, so this whole policy is only in excess. Anything like the reallocation is only okay. And then, yeah, I just want to make a statement about this reallocation because it does bother me um, some. I, I would feel that it would. Um, some people might not give, or some PTAs might not give if we're then going to turn around and take it out of their school and put it somewhere else. I understand. Equity, and we as a board have to, you know, share all the money, make sure all our schools with our town money, everything is equitable. But I, I don't know. I think it's kind of hard to tell a PTA that. Hold that thought, so we can have you on the record. Thank you. Or I guess I should say I'm just not comfortable with telling the PTA. Well, you know, I, yeah. It'd be very nice of you to give this gift, but you, you can't have it in your school. We're shipping it somewhere else. And so I think you might end up, in essence, getting less gifts by the PTAs than we have in the past. So I'm just throwing that out for you. Any further comments from the board members? Mr. Bellamy? Well, um, to a certain extent, I think I would consider that I think one of the reasons that the language was clear education I think the board has an obligation to make sure it's fairly. Um, and that may be our obligation for this. Clear and equitable, I think we're obligated to correct them, whether they're gifts or not. And so I, I understand the desire to have a gift remain in school and give them. We perceive inequities. I would, I would indicate we have an obligation to remedy those equities. So this was an effort to balance that interest of keeping the gift in the school. If it's a borderline education, and there's a presumption or a preference to keep it in the school and that purchase the nations and or gifts to the school. But if they're clear inequities, we would, whether it's a policy, this policy or not, I think it would have an overall policy to make sure it's equity in the school to still arrive any gift giving policy. So in essence, it was, it was an effort, I think. I, I appreciate that thought of trying to make hand get in school, but I think that was the language was there, such that it was trying to balance. 
So if I, if, I, if I were to understand this correctly, then we already have a policy on the book that says if you give a gift to the district, then there's a, a chance that it could be reallocated. That, that's our current policy. And the, and the, uh, I'm not sure that the current policy says that. It does yeah. not say that. I believe the current policy is that which is written. Which is before what? acceptance to ensure that gifts do not create. All the, the, okay, so, so, there's, so there's, it's, it's an unstated. Unstated. And one of the considerations by the board subcommittee was to make sure that those who did give gifts were aware, name the PTAs, that this possibility does exist. Okay. And it's, it exists for statutory reasons or it exists because it came about in subcommittee? The, propo the proposed <coughs> change to the board was suggested by a board member. Okay. to the subcommittee for the subcommittee to address. Okay. The subcommittee addressed this two weeks ago. Um, two members of the subcommittee were there, Mrs. Brand and Mr. Fadby. I think Mr. Lou was in the group as well. Um, when this language was crafted and then an individual board member uh, revised the language to make sure that it was the people were scared. And then we added the in excess of five hundred dollars. That was added because the original discussion was all gifts and equipment, and then we started thinking. I mean, we all know what PTAs give, and they give a lot and on and on and on, from paper cups to you name it. So we decided to come up with a dollar figure that would represent 
something that's clear to become capable. Um, I mean, I understand the need for this. I mean, it's certainly, it's, it's difficult. And, and, and to Mrs. Zahn's point, it, it's come about really because of the smart boards before it was played around. You know, now it's the smart boards. Thank you. Um, I mean, that's really the, the you know, it's called spate spate. That's what it is. I mean, there's some schools who've decided they're, um, you know, they want to give smart boards, and subsequently, some schools have more smart boards than others as a result. And I understand the need to try and dial that back. Um, I'm not opposed to um, a policy like this. I just think the language needs to be cleaned up a little bit. Um, I like the including but not limited to PTA students, public spirits, uh, public uh, citizens, rather. Um, not that I want to discourage gifts because I don't. Just to the extent possible, I think we need to sort of rein this in. I, I think it's gotten, it's gone a little bit too far. It's one thing to give a teacher learning grant. It's one thing to give a cafeteria table. Um, it's one thing to buy some park benches. It's another thing when we're giving one district a leg up in a tech, in the technology area that somebody else at another school doesn't have that opportunity to do because for whatever reason their PTA doesn't have that money or their PTA chose to put their money in other places. I just think that's our job. I think that's our responsibility to decide to help with administration where those resources need to be um, and not necessarily the, the, the PTA. And I'm probably going to get a ton of hate mail in the morning, but. Um, <laughs> But that's my thought. I, I just think it needs to be reined in a little bit. I mean, I know, I can speak personally, I got a survey from my PTA asking the types of things that they wanted us to spend money on with the money they raised. And one of the things they asked is, do you want us to buy smart boards? Um, I just, I don't think they should be in the business of buying smart boards. I think that's the, something we should be rolling out, we should be doing. And, um, I don't want to get so nitty gritty as to say you can't buy technology. I mean, certainly I don't have a problem if they want to buy DVDs or something, but um, I think we're on the right track. I just think you need to tighten this up a little bit grammatically, and um, I would encourage board members to think about it and, um, you know, consider passing it when we do finally get it all together. This is on again, Mr. Matola. Thank you. I just, let's make it perfectly clear that this board does allocate what is needed to educate our children equitably across the board. And what PTAs decide to do is above and beyond. Um, I, I don't necessarily look at that as an inequity. They might have more, so more kids at one time can use, but everybody is being able to use smart boards across the district. So. Um, wanted to make that clear that we do provide what is needed um, for the educational system for our children. And um, with that, um, I know this is first read, but I'd like to send it first back to some committee before it's put on the next agenda for the uh, vote. Thank you. Mr. Mottola? And just real briefly, I, I understand what Mrs. Iacomo was saying. I just, um, mm -hmm. and I do agree to a certain extent. But I don't think the goals of equity that we're charged with providing and gifts given by PTAs, I don't think those are two mutually exclusive things. Uh, I think they can work in conjunction with each other. I think, I think PTAs and whoever else do certain things for our schools help us achieve equity in the district to a certain extent. So, but it's, you know, it is a tough issue. I certainly understand. You know, the arguments pro and con of this policy. I, I, I probably will support it, but I, I do need to see the revised language. This is my code, and I think that after this, we'll wrap it up. I'll just leave you with one thought, and that is yeah, I think this is an effort to sort of dial things back a little bit. I certainly don't discourage, and I certainly appreciate everything. Trust me, I'm writing a check every other week to PTA. Um, but in California, it got to be to a point where 
there were so there was so much gift giving and it was getting so big and so grand that they actually passed a proposition um, that doesn't allow this anymore. It goes straight to the state and then it gets allocated from there. So nobody can give one district more than another. Um, so I just I sort of see this as a preventative measure before things start to get a little bit out of control and um, you know it's just food for thought. Mr. Boyle, if I may ask, just um, perhaps it would be helpful if, as an example because clearly smart boards are an expensive item and we know the PTAs have well-intentioned um, approached and are considering purchasing them again this year. If you would be kind enough in subcommittee to have the actual technology plan and what the plan is for smart boards and then where we are so that perhaps we can actually appreciate the impact this is having. Thank you. Thank you very much. Relative to the smart boards, I think there, um, I believe, as we went through the budget process, that there was a plan that was put forth by the administration to equalize, or better equalize, the smart board allocation based on the capital pathway expenditures of the board. So the attempt to equalize it has never been, at least in my experience, to take away, but actually through board funding, the town funding, to provide equity in those areas. Uh, one of the other issues that you know, we may want to consider is the uh, having value in excess of modern development. If we are truly talking about smart boards or material, you know, or equipment, materials of uh, significant value, we may be talking about $1,500 or $2,000 or $1,000. We could pick the number, but the, the level of significance, and I think that was the attempt when we came up with the $500 to make it so that, again, it wasn't a paper nightmare, but to, to try to monitor any inequities of significance. And Mrs. Iacona, I think you're absolutely right. This ge the genesis here probably had to do with smart boards um, from one school to another school. And then as we looked at that and discussed it um, over the past six months or a year or so, sometimes there's more than one. My Thank you very much, Mr. Boyle. Do any other board members have any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. The next item on the agenda, we have the race to the top grant. We have a recommended motion that the Board of Education approve the fine for the race to the top grant and authorize the superintendent and the Board of Education chairman to sign off on the memo of understanding. Do I have a motion? Sign. Second by Mr. Matola. Thank you. If Mrs. Katayla Leonard is going to is here to answer any questions you may have, we have um, sent you the application. We've sent you the memorandum of understanding. I would note that the if we are going to indicate to the state that we are interested in participating, it also requires the signature of Mrs. Sparanak, the FDA president, and Mr. Carey was at PTA Council last night, and Senator McKinney talked about some of the legislation that the legislature has put into action so that Connecticut is better able to apply for the race for the top funds. I believe we should apply, or at least indicate an interest in wanting to move forward. Many of the items with which we struggle have been removed from the first application particularly at the high school level. Many of the areas which we would have to indicate that we're working on are things we're already doing, and some of them, by law, we have to do anyway. The changing graduation requirements, the teacher effectiveness evaluation system, having county in the schools, those have already been established as law with timelines. It's not a lot of money for which we would be eligible, but I fear because we're going to have to do these anyway, we should, we should go forward and apply for them. And I will tell you that not everyone believes Connecticut will achieve the funding. And Mr. Carey can correct me if he thinks I'm wrong, but I asked the three members of the legislature who were there last night, if Connecticut doesn't get the funding, if they roll back, the legislative requirements they put on place so we could apply. 
we don't get the funding, would they take them off the books? They said no. So we do need to do what's in the body of the race for the top grid as legislation. I think we should try to get funds to help us do it. Dr. Clark, would you like to offer a friendly amendment then to this to include Marilyn Farinak instead of the teachers? I would, please. Thank you. Clark said that in the meeting we have an FDA president also sign it. So it needs to be written. Well, I understand that, but my concern is that uh, we don't control them. That, that's what I was going to Thank you. You're right. You're right. As long as everyone knows that the application is not complete without her signature. Right. That's their own decision. Right. Thank you. You're right. We may wish we could control Mrs. Farinac, but we don't. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Can we assess what this is going to cost us to, to sign up for this? And do we have any indication that when Kennedy doesn't get the money, we can unwind that? You were you were there last night. I don't believe, and I'm having conversations with the commissioner about this actually. I don't believe this legislation is going to go away. And it's really interesting to me how this has evolved. I think you may remember three years ago the commissioner rolled out a high school reform package. It was not funded by the legislature. The first application for Race to the Top included high school reform measures. That was in the application process. We came to you and said, we can't afford to do this and we're not going to get enough money to cover those expenses. They've since rolled that back, and so now the High School Reform Act is part of the Race to the Top second application. I don't believe if we don't get funding, it will be rolled back. I think districts will be asked, will be expected to comply with all of the provisions in this. It's been on the books for a long time, it's something the State Board of Education wants. It's it was basically formulated to reduce the achievement gap in the urban areas. And yet it's broad sweeping. It, there, we have not been able to estimate how much it would cost us yet. And I want to wait to see whether or not Connecticut gets the money. And then if they don't, if the legislature would then go back and extend the timelines for this. Some of them are quite far out. And you don't have to start this immediately. Cali is law that um, it's the Connecticut Accountability for Learning Initiative. We're doing most of it now. It's having teachers look at data, having that as part of the teacher evaluation. We're doing that. It's law already on the books that every school has to have it in place by 2015. So if, if I were to understand you correctly, the goals that we're signing up here for most, if not all of them, are being mandated by the laws that we Yes, it's um, the, the Office of Legislative Research has put the whole bill together. It was passed. I um, don't have the bill number with me, but I can send it to you. Sorry, 438. It, it was passed, and that's what the three representatives were talking about last night. I believe it's 19 pages of reforms, um, and we'll send them to you. Yeah, and, and just to, my take on the conversation at PTA Council was that um, the representatives were doubtful that it would yield to accrue enough points to actually get funding in this round, which is supposed to be the last round at this point. Their perception was that 
um, we didn't have enough progressive ideas far enough along in terms of reforms. And we're just forming commissions now where other states are already past that point and are implementing things. So they felt that that was a disadvantage. Uh, there was some disagreement on whether or not they can unwind the laws that they have signed to make us look more favorable. Um, but they felt that in large part, I think, across party lines, there was kind of half measures that the state had done, and therefore we wouldn't be in a very favorable position compared to other states. So um, it'll be interesting to see if they do unwind it, but I think we have to face what has been passed and what's possible. So I guess one of my confusions is if well, this has been implemented by law or by fiat, why we have to sign up for it. If I could respond to that. We, Connecticut would not be eligible to apply for Race for the Top grants unless we had laws to demonstrate that there is a push to increase graduation requirements, that teacher decision making will be informed by data. In order to apply for Race for the Top, we had to have these laws enacted. I believe this has been good news for people at the State Department who've been trying to get these laws passed. And before, the legislature would say, for example, in school suspension, there was a huge argument about it because they said, you're asking districts to do something and not providing any funding. That's why it got delayed for three years. It's law now. As of July 1, it's the law. Is there any funding? No. These initiatives would have cost districts a lot of money, especially the urban centers, and so the legislature has not enacted them. In order now to be able to be eligible for some money, they had to enact the laws. And I, you heard me ask Point Black last night, does that mean if we don't get the money from the federal government, you'll we'll roll these back? So I think we should at least try. Connecticut won't receive the grant if most districts don't sign on. So we can, we're actually helping them. If we sign on, we'll help them get the money. Ms. Zellman? I'm sorry, are you? Ms. Thank you. Um, through the chair to Dr. Clark, do we know how many district in, districts in Connecticut thus far are uh, signing on to this? As I know from Kate, there's been some question. Uh, my information was not very many at all. That was the first go around. Districts similar to us decided not to do it. I believe the second go around we'll see many more. It's too early. I think we're one of the first boards to have a meeting to get a board vote. Because the memorandum of understanding just came out. The first go around was 61. Right, 61 the first time. Which I think it'll double this time. And they're allowing the smaller districts, the very small districts, particularly in eastern Connecticut, to consolidate and work through the rest, which has made it much more appealing. Excuse me. Uh, thank you. For the chair with the board, rather, for you to see what other communities are doing to table this before we vote on it. the date we have to submit it. Mm -hmm. We have to submit um, this May 19th. <laughs> Sorry. That's the thing. Okay. Mr. Gordon. A couple of questions. The first one is that, um, to the chair, Dr. Clark, uh, you had mentioned that there is some legislation that's already passed that uh, incorporates a lot of the obligations that are under, that are under this memorandum, memorandum of understanding. Are there any additional obligations this, in this memorandum of understanding that you're aware of or know of that are in addition to those newly enacted laws? No, the, the law itself, in order for Connecticut to apply to Race to the Top, they had to say that they would look at high school reform. It, it's, all, it's all in the law. The, what, because of the rush to the top, for the Race to the Top to get this done, there, are, there will be a lot of details to be worked out. For example, the senior project at the high school and exams, they're, they're talking about a, a statewide exam for high school seniors before they graduate from high school. 
there's a lot of work that has to be done on that, which is why I think they put it out to, I think that was 2017. And one of the things they talked about is that there will be statewide curricula in the areas where there will be the exams. Fairfield and districts like us will have to take that, in my opinion, as our baseline and go beyond. Whether or not we apply for Race for the Top, this has been a push of the commissioners. There will be statewide curricula. There will be statewide exams. If we, and if we don't, if Connecticut gets the money and we have not applied, we won't get any funding. We'll still have to do everything within the law and within the Race to the Top application. Can you're done? Right, right. Okay, no, I'll just check. One related to this and one no. Um, in this memorandum memorandum understanding, MOU I'm told since I can't say the other one. <laughs> um, it's indicated that collab uh that you're gonna collaborate with the Connecticut State um, Board of Ed to ensure equitable distribution of effective teachers and principals and via cooperative grants and so forth. Now, how do you, what is the meaning of that? And is there a possibility that if we in Fairfield have good teachers, if we do have good teachers, we're gonna now have to collaborate to ensure equitable distribution among the state of those good teachers so that there's a possibility that our good teachers may be drawn away no, from that our district? It's, it's within a district. And again, a lot of this is directed at some of the urban areas where they have schools that continually each year fail to meet adequate early progress according to your child left behind. This would, for example, this does not happen in perfect. But let's say that year after year after year after year, we had one middle school where the students failed to meet goal on the statewide tests. This provision says, as part of the whole thing with teacher evaluation, are you taking a look at the growth the students are making over time? And if it turns out that every teacher in one particular school is not helping students achieve, then we have the right to, which we do by our contract anyway in Fairfield, we can move teachers for educational reasons. This is geared much more to the urban areas. Another, another financial question now. Um, this funding that we may or may not get is going to be a portion, as I understand it, based on our side of one party, one of your seat. Could you give me a feel for, in, with respect to the rest of the state, other districts? Is our Title I Part A monies a large part compared to other districts or a small number? Title I funding is allocated based on the number of children you have in your district who live in poverty, who are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Therefore, the R amount is almost minimal, unless you compare us to Wilton, Weston, Westport, Darien, and Canaan. We, I'm sure we get more than they do. The Title I funding is is strictly targeted for children living in poverty. Hartford, Bridgeport, Meriden, New Haven, Willimantic, Wyndham, Meriden, New Britain, those are the districts that get the significant title in dollars. I think our total amount is, the last time we brought this to you, we were eligible for $133 over three years, $133,000 over three years. It's been raised to 140,000. Not significant, not going to cover the cost of everything here, but it would be better than nothing because we're gonna to have to do this anyway. So the expectation of the funds, even if we should get funds, it's gonna be in essence a minimum amount of money. Um, but it will help. Compared to our budget. It will help. Uh, and the question in my mind is, there are certain obligations in the MOU, um, not knowing what the law 
passages and how they overlap. Uh, it's hard to say to me what this is going to be doing. That's the problem that I have. As far as concerns of the I understand the state's interest. It's good for the state. But being as we're one of the better districts in the state, we may be at a, a disadvantage of being a better district not quite as good a district in the state, I'm sure that other districts in urban areas are advocating this greatly because they have much more of a benefit to receive than us. Right, but, but we we will have to do, do everything that's in the memorandum of understanding. This if is how this, No, no, these are, this has become law. Effective July 1, every, you have to start, the time is clicking. <laughs> To perhaps clarify or continue on Mr. Batty's uh, line of questioning through the chair to Dr. Clark, um, while this has become law and we would be required to do the um, items that are in here regardless of whether we sign up for the race to the top funding. How much of this are we already doing in our district? And how much that we are not doing would incur costs, and do we know what sort of costs that we would be um, subject to? What's our exposure? That's a, that's a great question. We are already well along in most of these well along. We have not had a time, because we got this so recently, to cost out some of the things that we aren't doing. However, if you, if you take a look, at, for example, let's look at goal two, data systems to support instruction. Under the leadership of Mr. Boyle and administrators in our district, we invited the state to Fairfield to take a look at our new data system that we implemented this year so that every teacher has access to student achievement data right at their fingertips. It's called STARS. It's working really well. We're ahead in that, and we brought the state out to show it to them because we're hoping they like this model so much that they will fund it, particularly for us, because we'd be willing to have other districts come and take a look at it. We're ahead of that, and it's something that if you really want to improve student achievement, teachers need data at their fingertips, and they need to be able to keep it from year to year to year, so that a grade eight teacher has access to all of the data on student achievement for each particular child. We're ahead of most districts in that. The data to support state and federal research, we have that. The um, Connecticut Mastery Test Vertical Scale results into local accountability, we have that. Professional development, we know we do that. And make available appropriate data. We're all, we're there. We've met that goal. You can go through each one and see how we're doing. What I will do is send you the law tomorrow. I will email it to you rather than give you a hard copy because it's so long. And again, on some things we're doing well, on others we're not. And the law is much more comprehensive than the race to the top. For example, it says, by law, now you have to have two parent-teacher conferences a year. You do that at the elementary, you do it for some parents at the middle, you do it at the high school. I don't know if that will cost us anything about it. Through the chair to Dr. Clark. So my question is, if every single piece of this is now law, or will be law, July 1st, is that? But some of them have very long timelines. So you have to start them July 1, but they don't go into effect some in 2015, 16, 17. But everybody has to start them? We're compelled to start them. OK, let me ask this question. Why would you not sign up for this? Like, if everybody, if everybody, everybody in the state has to 
to do this now. Why wouldn't you sign up to get some money to help you do it? Right. The, the, What's going to make people say, no, I don't want to <laughs> well, there's a lot of it. Well, and it's interesting looking at this area because I learned this week that the CEA is also asking their union presidents to sign off. What happened between the first and the second is actually, I think, a tremendous political strategy. Before, in the Race to the Top grant, there were a lot of things that educators and the State Board of Ed wanted districts to do. And that if you applied for the grant and supported the state's application for the grant, then you signed on saying you would do it. And then if you didn't get the money. And part of the reason they didn't get the money, as Mr. Carey said, is there wasn't legislation for this and legislation for this and legislation for that. So, with a lot of collaboration with the Legislation Education Committee and the State Board of Ed, they put everything they needed to make a better application into law. So now, this is Patch 22. You can decide not to apply for the money, and I think if you wanted the few districts who didn't, you still have to do this, and if Connecticut got the monthly grant, you wouldn't get the funding. So the great political strategy for them to start moving forward on things they wanted Dr. Clark, we're doing a lot of it anyway. Right. We're obligated to do it regardless. There's no penalty for applying. Right. So quite frankly, there's no downside. I, don't, I do not see a downside. The last time I did. But I mean, this bill has totally changed it. Right. Thank you. Any further comments from the board? Can I now invite anyone in the public if they wish to address this? Mr. Dunn? Come on up. Thank you. Mr. Wu, Mrs. Gow, Mr. Mutella, myself, Mrs. Ayacono, 
and Mr. Fadigan. And please, um, in, in opposition, I have Mrs. Zahn and Mr. Carey. Thank you very much. Thank you. For the record, I'm staying. Thank you. The discussion of the 2010 and 2011 budget adjustments. That's all I can vote on the agenda. Yeah, it's your job. Um, <laughs> the next we have reports um, from members of the Board of Education. Um, Sarah, is your on? Yes, thank you. So I follow, um, last week and this week we had AP exams and was it going well and we're excited to have yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, Also, our senior internship program starts next Thursday, 20th, and past couple of weeks, seniors that are involved in the program, the meeting with the faculty mentors and have been visiting their sites for the first time and going on interviews. And so everyone that's participating is really excited to go out and participate. And um, next Tuesday, or not next Tuesday, uh, the 25th, is our National Honor Society election for our new members and also seniors um, get the awards for graduation and get recognized. And with school and day graduations approaching, it's been a really great event. Thank you, Tom. Yes, well, we, um, because it's a national field, we've been working to get the exam ourselves. But um, just recently, we had our spring musical was performed. I myself uh, experienced most of it at the stage. I was photographing, helping out, but just looking at the rehearsals and the attitude backstage, you can see that they put a lot of effort into a number of great things about the show. Um, speaking of entertainment, uh, within our music department, this Thursday we have our senior awards concert where we recognize our exceptional graduating um, and in addition to June 30th of our spring summer concerts. Um, in terms of um, more academic related matters, progress reports are this week. Um, spring sports are currently underway. Um, notably, this Friday is the annual Ward Logo baseball game held at Harvard Yard, and that's that's a pretty big event, we can get excited for that. Um, and of course, and we've been talking about this breath life policy, proms are coming up. Junior proms for us is May 22nd, and June 5th is our senior prom. Um, and last but not least, um, a couple weekends ago, um, a student at board, Allie Tchaikovsky and her mother, um, ran a breast cancer um, benefit called Catwalk for a Cure at the Brooklyn Country Club. Um, and it involved students from Ward, from Ludlow, and even from Barefoot Prep. Um, and it basically brought all the kids together for a good cause and actually raised quite a good amount of money. Um, I, was, I, was hap I was helping out with that too, and I was happy to see um, how students involved really got the job done. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, could we just ask you, the chair, what time does the baseball game start? I myself don't know. Um, Looks like 7 o'clock. Either that or that's the seventh inning stretch. <laughs> 7 o'clock. Thank you. Okay, I agree. I think I'm up next. Um, I have a, a couple of things. Um, I have actually been staying in contact with the director of CES, and he just wanted me to review. He sent us a packet. Um, and it covers 16 districts, for those of you who don't know, just an update. We include the Power Regional Center for the Arts, Special Ed Services, on-site and also um, off. 66 Magnet School, Professional Services as well as Policy, Search Committees and Educational Programs, and um, Relative for Board of Health Report. H1N1 is winding down. They are returning vaccines. 
the farmer's market that caught a lot of press. There was a policy passed last night. Um, and uh, there is also prep for summer school with the nursing. And they had a presentation at uh, North Strathill School, I believe, um, about head lice. And the Strathill School summer in for um, the mercury vapors. Um, the testing is being prepared for Strathill School. And in addition, they also have um, school gardens, or excuse the expression, springing up. And the health department is working with our um, central office staff, I believe, um, the person who's head of um, the health curriculum. And they're going to make it, quite frankly, um, a review and a way to monitor the protocol. So for instance, that they wouldn't be using pressurized wood, which has arsenic in it but they'll also work with the students and have them and teach them how to review it, make sure they're following the protocol. So it's quite frankly um, a great addition over there. So the next one I have um, for reports, Mrs. Dale. Thank you. Um, first, just with Kate, I just want to mention how it was um, wonderful to see the Student Leadership Awards tonight. And I think everyone here would agree with me that we have amazing students here in Fairfield, so it was nice to see them out here. I mean, they do the work anyway, because that's who they are, but it's, it's nice to give them pat on the back and recognition, so that was nice. Um, for SEPTA, we have a SEPTA meeting tomorrow evening. Um, Marlene Cavagulo, who is the retiring ECC director, which is why we had a new one that was approved this evening, um, is going to be given the Friend of SEPTA Award at tomorrow night's meeting, so that is exciting for everyone. Um, at our meeting last month, we did have a, a great presentation by Dan Caruso, who was a Catholic attorney. Well, you got <laughs> equal timing. <laughs> anyway, Dan Caruso, who was our town probate judge, did a wonderful um, presentation on guardianship and conservatorship. I'm sorry. Uh, and the other super <laughs> um, for children with special needs once they reach 18. And it was really a, a very good presentation and I think it relieved a lot of fears of some of the parents who, when they have younger children, they just hear what's going to happen at 18. But having um, Judge Crusoe actually there, and he's the one they go before, and so he could explain the process and walk them through, I think it was a very beneficial program for, for parents. Um, next Thursday, I hope to mark on your calendars, May 20th, between 5 and 8. Um, I hope you will all go to Friendly's for ice cream or dinner, because SEPTA will receive 15% of your sales, whether it's eat-in or take-out. Um, and we have Riverfield PTA to thank for this, because I guess they had the date on the calendar, and they bequeathed it to SEPTA. So we thank Riverfield PTA after this um, opportunity to earn some money. And um, some of the money they have earned in the past, they are using as grants. They just sent uh, or granted um, two recipients for a grant to attend the Yukon from Shoot Professional Development Program. I know that's a strange word, but they have it from a combination of the words conference, fraternity, and institute. And they put that together. It's July 11th to 16th. What, it, what is it, you might ask, because I have the same question. Um, it's about enrichment, learning, and teaching um, strategies for um, teachers so that they can meet the needs of gifted and talented children. And um, Dave, uh, I'm sorry, Diane Paella, library media specialist at Fairfield Little High School, and Tim Wagner, a special ed teacher at the alternate high school with two recipients of those grants. Other than that, they're just busy doing their usual things like family nights at the Y, challenger baseball, family dances, yoga, all sorts of activities for the children and for um, families as well. So, okay. Sounds like that, nothing from the, from the finance. Thank you very much. Mr. Fadaby, do you have an update for transportation? Thank you so much. Mrs. Iacona? 
Finance, Budget, and Community Relations Subcommittee has met twice, three times. I don't know, I lost track. Um, but we are currently working on um, recommendations uh, pertaining to the $3 million budget cut that we are faced with. And um, pleased to report we got positive news this morning in that our medical insurance reduction, um, we were able to add $600,000 to that line, so we're now looking at $1.6 million that we can uh, use to offset the $3 million uh, cut that we've received to our budget. Um, so we um, are working right now um, on putting together our spreadsheet of recommendations uh, for full, full board review um, at our next board meeting. Um, and we plan to um, recommend following the same format that we used last year. We'll give you a spreadsheet that shows four quadrants, what the um, central office recommended, um, what we discussed, what we don't recommend touching, um, what we recommend cutting, and what might possibly need um, more board discussion. Um, but uh, I'm happy to say we're given the circumstances we're in a relatively um, decent shape, whatever that may, may mean. Um, we are going to meet again next Tuesday to finalize uh, that report before we bring it forward to everyone here at the board table. But it's been a very productive, um, they've been very productive sessions. Regarding Special Projects Standing Building Committee, um, we're really kind of in a holding pattern at this point. Some of the things we have left on the checklist um, over at Osborne Hill and Sherman um, just kind of need to wait for the weather to happen. Like there's a tree that needs to be planted in Sherman. There's still some caulking that needs to be done at both of the schools. The biggest thing we're faced with right now um, are some drainage issues. Um, some at Osborne Hill and some at Sherman. So we have hired an engineer to assess that and now we're in the process of um, possibly having to hire a surveyor to look at the pitch of the asphalt and the way it was laid, try and figure out why things aren't draining the way they're draining. Um, so we're going to meet, uh, I believe the 24th uh, is our next meeting because our regular scheduled meeting was Memorial Day. Um, and then, as you know, the RTM adopted the town budget and decided not to make further cuts to the education budget. So, um, speaking for myself, and I know fellow board members were grateful for that. And that's all I have to report. Mr. Perry? Okay, I'll start with PTA Council, if that's all right. Um, sure. Last two meetings uh, since we last met, um, had an interesting presentation of our PTA at PTA Council uh, from the group that's within the community farm. Also, PTA Council has started a new committee, the Green Team Committee, to look at um, green schools. Uh, that's going to be headed by Michelle Stearns. Uh, in the last meeting, um, a couple of auspicious events. One was that the uh, transition to the new officers for this year. Uh, just very quickly, the president uh, this year is going to be Mary Ho. Uh, the uh, past president nominees to show us the uh, Charlotte was the opposite. The uh, VPA program is going to think, and the VPA curriculum is going to be Lenora Campbell, the VPA leadership, Richard Joslin, the VPA legislation and membership, uh, Julie Gottlieb, treasurer, uh, Debbie Blanchard, corresponding secretary, Ann Ratner, reporting secretary, Michelle Lindsay, and the board of ed reps, um, Lisa Henry, and uh, Nancy Shoot are here uh, this evening. We're going to this meeting tonight. So that's the officers from the PTA Council for next year. We thank them for all the hard work and efforts uh, of the uh, district. Uh, we also had a very interesting discussion uh, with our State Senator McKinney and two state reps, uh, Representative Fawcett and Vaughn. Um, things I pulled out of that discussion, which I find to be uh, alarming, is that this year was an easy year, apparently. And they're indicating that we have a three to three and a half billion dollar budget deficit on a 18 billion dollar budget coming up next year at the state level. Uh, this year, apparently, the way they fixed the budget hole was they borrowed a billion dollars, uh, which obviously has to be paid down. Uh, so there is not a lot more room for things moving forward. What they indicated was how the program payments would likely be cut moving forward, 
they felt at this time, and obviously it's a moving target, that the construction projects and the reimbursement levels we receive should remain in place, and we should continue not to worry about things like Fairfield Woods, scratch field, the progress we have ongoing in terms of that reimbursement. So that was some positive news. But out of that, uh, and, and a conversation of the evening, which I promised some people I'll try to be short tonight, um, we do really, I think, need to have another point of some serious discussions about governance, especially um, grants and monies that come from state and federal level based on the economy circumstances of the base. We have to look at that more, more closely as we board at some point. That's what I pulled out of that conversation. Uh, facilities Committee, uh, we're, we're, we're plotting forward. Um, what I think the big message is uh, that we will be having discussions as early as our next meeting on May 18th on the feeder pattern for middle schools. So it's for one of the parents that, that equals redistricting. Um, to what extent that is going to be, we'll start discussing. But I think that we want to make sure the public's aware of that. Um, additionally, uh, we've been doing a lot of that foundational work around there. Um, we have uh, managed to improve facilities planning principles, which will be brought before this board and we'll be sometime in the next meeting or two. Uh, we still have to get those over to the chair and vice chair, so I apologize, but the uh, subcommittee has been forward on basically a template for plans to be measured against. Additionally, uh, we are uh, working and have an open RFI uh, to hopefully find uh, uh, alternate enrollment projected methodologies uh, that will focus on in particular, more accuracy at the building level, of course, and hopefully smaller variances over the long term. Uh, and lastly, um, at the last meeting, we got this wonderful report, which our team might now work very hard on the top of that, um, which is a description of alternate uses of space. I want to get that copy of that and we'll share it with the rest of the board. And I believe Dr. Parker is going to post it for the public as well. Uh, it's a very interesting document that tells you about all the spaces in every one of our 16 buildings where we're educating students and not necessarily the ideal space. So it kind of gives you a picture of what our buildings look like. And the next exercise that we're going to be performing over the summer is to review the buildings uh, and update our capacities for each of the facilities um, to make sure that we have uh, updated current capacities against the current building. So that's where we're at in terms of foundational work against the potential plan. And we'll have to get back into looking at um, our long-term plan and getting back into that as well as we still have things to work. Along those lines, uh, please share, I do have a couple of issues that have come up in the subcommittee that I wanted to share with the board, maybe get a sense of the body. Um, one that I found concerning the last meeting that Mr. Cullen brought to our attention um, was apparently we are in a um, relationship with the town where we can either use natural gas or oil, diesel in this case, to fuel our boilers in the winter. And what's happened is you switch back and forth as you have dual use boilers. Um, as a means to save money if natural gas is cheaper, we use natural gas. If oil is cheaper, we use oil. For the last two years, we've been using natural gas consistently. And let's create a situation where we have thousands and thousands of gallons of diesel now in tanks that's turned into sludge. And this is a problem that's shared by the town, is that the town facilities also have not been using you know, oil and diesel. We're going to have to get something to thin that out before we run it through boilers so that we don't damage your boilers. There could be a cost associated with that. I'm not exactly sure what that cost is yet, but it might not be expensive. i got to imagine a gallon of something that's going to thin out oil will probably be cheaper and more expensive than a gallon of oil. And some of our oil tanks are 15,000 gallons. So to that point, uh, Mr. Cohen wanted to try to uh, start working with the town. Um, and I guess Mr. White would be the person to speak to to see if they can collaborate and find a way um, to get some economy of scale in this problem. And um, thought it might be appropriate for us to, uh, since the body has a chair, some message to a uh, note to Chris like you know, that we're concerned about this problem and would like to work together with the town to, to try to find an economical way to relieve it. I have a, a question. Um, the long-range facility plan and also the document I think that you have, would um, both of those be ready for a Friday packet, for instance, this week? So that we can send it out. Just the, this so document here, I believe, is complete um, and would be ready. The long-range facility plan is, is, a, uh, is 
basically uh, a work in progress. So, uh, Did you have one that you approved? This, I'm sorry, the, the, the principles. Yes, those, oh. those are yes. They, they won't be, uh, oh, that would be great. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And relative to the latter, which is the issue that the mail tank and board members would like, what I'm thinking about is if we could ask Mr. Cullen to, when you do meet, um, if board members are in agreement with this, could you please come back to the board and give us an estimate of what we think this is going to cost? Because uh, clearly we have concerns. Is, do board member shares that they are, are they comfortable? Do I have a sense of body that that's appropriate? And I'm seeing none in kids. Yeah, I do, but I, I just, can make, um, in, in order to make this, make, make the town understand, I think something needs to be done in writing to the person like we Is that what the effect was in what you want, Mr. Yes, Cole? That, that way is what we discussed. Okay. Just so send a letter, is that okay to everyone? That's the question. Mr. Cullen, did you want to have, we can actually send a letter, and if the board is comfortable with it, I'll, I'll share it with board members and then sign it if that's okay. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's, there's, there's two bigger issues here. One is, is that we're somewhat at the mercy of the town's direction in terms of the fuel that we use. Um, my concern is the money we might have saved over the last two years by running natural gas, we might have to pay back threefold, I don't know what the dollars are here. Um, so we need to find a way to, to consider some of these things. And then the other thing is, since we are in a financial discussion right now, um, if this is going to be a big ticket item, we, we need to consider that in the budgeting process. So, you know, I don't know if this is going to cost us $1,000, $100,000 to fix this problem, um, but we probably should have some means by which we include this in the college budget. Um, so that's not a surprise in September that we're switching the oil and buy this accelerant to, to fit these old tanks. May I ask a question, Mr. Cullen? Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I figured that the Board of Education is responsible for roughly, what, 17 buildings? And how many is the town? Uh, 16 school buildings. Do we? St. Henry's is done a different way. Oh, is it? All right, so we're not responsible for sale? Hill, Hill, Burns, Gas. sound like we're pointing fingers. I don't think anybody realized we were going to burn gas for so long. No, we did two full sure. years and with the price of oil going up, I would imagine we're going to go the next winter burning gas again. And it was brought to our attention by two different contractors that are doing testing and preventive maintenance on our boilers and another company that's doing testing and preventive maintenance on our fuel up tanks. That this oil in the ground is sitting there a long time. And just to get a little history on Gas burns cleaner than oil does. So when you switch to gas, it's actually cleaner, it's cleaner than the boiler, it's cleaner than chimneys, the oil is a little bit dirtier. And we're concerned that when we switch to oil, thousands of gallons of oil that's been sitting two or three years, it gives us some real problems. Um, I don't have all the answers yet, I have a lot of people investigating. Uh, if we can put an additive in the oil, what that costs. Somebody had mentioned at one time that we sell the oil and pump it back out. But I uh, can't imagine anybody would want to buy the oil knowing it's been sitting for two or three years either. It's a to do something to it. So we're still investigating it, trying to get all the answers together. Uh, we have to come back to the board. Do you have a sense of the timing of that? Uh, let's see. Let's see. Oh, we have our next meeting May 25th, so are we looking at June 8th? Um, I would say probably by June. Okay. And do you know our other municipalities encountering the same? Um, I had Dave Fryer call Rich White and see. He also said they were concerned and talking to their contractors. They say, whatever the town does, we do. We do the gas together. Well, I meant actually other municipalities besides the town of Fairfield. No, I haven't. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. Carey? Um, so. I mean, that, that was that was the, the, the big ticket item. Um, we have a couple other um, issues that we're still waiting for response on. I think we discussed that. Um, yeah, I, I believe we had one letter was about the building committee. Yeah, so. Sure. And on Hill and the other. 
so that, again, the framework for the board members, um, earlier in the year, we cut $6 million out of our capital plan. Um, uh, and uh, part of our plan moving forward is the, the district needs to understand what our exposure is going to be. A, if we're going to continue to stay at St. Amherst, and, and B, what the cost is for planning purposes. Um, we made a request to first selectman for that information, we got a response, but it really didn't give us all the information we need. So we're hoping that we can go back and kind of ask for some more specific information to take the cost. And we had some assurances that we're going to get the lease renewed, which is good, but for some reason that doesn't happen. That creates, at this point, a fire drill for our administrative team because we have basically 13 months left that we have to go to high school or relocate to all the high school. So that's wonderful. The other issue is, is that we have um, an outstanding request for capital improvement at Sherman, which is part of the project that uh, is not completed at Sherman, but we had no response to this stuff. And, uh, and that was a formal letter from the board. So uh, I think that we, at this point, need to go back and because that is something that wasn't our long term plan. Um, and there are safety and security issues there, uh, as well as um, cafeteria, the same problems that we're having with building system. And I think my, my other question for you is there's a, a timing issue with the central office space that we need to be aware of because I believe we have to give the town or the town has to give us notice as to it's, it's a timing. It isn't just when it's up, there's a lead time. Yeah, I'll go to some total steps. Correct me if I'm. My understanding is, is that the um, owner of the building, we own four floor, and we, if there's an option to buy that back, and if that happens, uh, then uh, we have a, a certain period of time to move out or release that, or a window on that.
Could you fill in a little bit for me, please? Yeah. All right. Or I can uh, bring it up next time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, real briefly, uh, the summary that we got our packet is really good, so I'm not going to repeat it. For <laughs> the benefit of the public, just some highlights. It's it's really moving along at Stratfield. If you go by the, the uh, frames up and they're in the brick up. Um, the highlights of the meeting last week were there was concern about four classrooms facing the construction. And, can't open the window because of dust and noise, and so the uh, building committee approved four air conditioning units for those classrooms. The cornerstone is going to be donated by the Mason, and they're figuring out what they're going to put on it. Um, there was a discussion at the last meeting about whether they wanted to install a gym floor this summer, but it was decided that they would wait because there was a concern about uh, whether it would be done the time for school would be open, so they, they decided to wait until next year, we'll definitely have plenty of time. Um, and then the uh, phase five, which is the FF and E is out the bid, it's the highlight, and the construction manager has commissioned uh, to hire, was commissioned to hire an independent roofing company just to inspect the roof at the school. Those are the highlights. And the next thing on the agenda, we have open board discussion with Brady Stretchy. Yes. Okay. And Mrs. Allen, you as well? Um, I just want to bring up um, something that a member of the public brought up tonight, which is the vending machines that went in. Can we just get a report as to... But I already put that in my notes. I didn't think that all the um, snack items, first of all, they were on the state approved list, but I think they've all been pulled. Okay. The ones like the Rice Krispies and everything, I'll check with, um, I know Mr. Cullen met with Mrs. Fitzpatrick about that, so I believe they were all pulled. Okay, so now we're mm -hmm. the, the intent was to have those the they did. I believe the top row had some snack items. Okay. And then um, we had some problems with the machines that broke down so they removed the healthy food from the body. Okay. So the snack stuff <laughs> remained. <laughs> The, the, pro the problem at Fairfield Ludlow High School was that the, the, the vending machines were made for us so that students could punch in their code and get their snack and their account would be charged. And so we had some very creative, bright, innovative students just keep punching until they got a code. 
and a child at the middle school got an exorbitant bill because once they knew that this particular code would release all these snaps. So that machine is out of commission and the company is trying to produce a machine that would be student proof. So that's why it was out of commission for a while. Something snaps are still buying, you can get it for free. <laughs> okay. Um, why did we put the vending machines in? I, I Many of our students do not have an opportunity to have lunch. Okay, so this was it. And so this is actually bundled meals. So you could buy a wrap with an apple, get some milk. Um, there were yogurts, there were um, vegetables, fruits. And this way, students were either using it to buy lunch or if they were on their way to an athletic event, they could grab something from the machine. Like, thank you. Because yeah. of the Rice Krispie treats or because of the apples? Because the idea is that you walk by Grab it, and go. Thank you. Just check. This is Ellen. Um, I just want to take this opportunity. We don't have a lot of people left in the audience, but to let everybody know that on June 10th, we are having a party in Fairfield for a certain somebody sitting at the other end of the table. And we'll be celebrating Dr. Clark's um, eight years here in Fairfield and a retirement party. And for anyone who is in the audience and hasn't heard about it, we will be getting a press release out to the papers as in addition to all the invitations that went out. So that, but if anyone does have any information, they could contact me through the, um, my board email address um, if they want information. And um, to note that um, the beneficiaries of the party, as well as being able to celebrate Dr. Clark's time with us and her commitment to us, are the two foundations. One, the High School Scholarship Foundation will be receiving a gift on, in her honor and also the Fairfield Education Foundation, which has been newly founded, and because of Dr. Clark's vision, it is something she spent quite a long time working on, establishing, and um, so it too will be one of the beneficiaries of, of the evening. And uh, just wanted to let everyone know, if they haven't heard, but that is June 10th, and it will be at Fairfield University. Any further? Um, I would just um, mention that Dr. Clark and I met Thursday afternoon to discuss primarily transition issues, and if Dr. Clark had anything in particular that she wanted to see on the agenda over the next several board meetings, as well as things that the board could do or I could do as chair to help facilitate the process to that end. I know that um, Dr. Title did want to have board members involved in um, a uh, roles and responsibilities CAVE program and I um, have asked board members to please just let me know what their vacation schedules look like to see whether or not it's something that's even possible. Also, um, I know Dr. Tite was aware of our budget updates. He's been staying in contact with Dr. Clark and has been on occasion coming down and getting oriented. I also um, I talked with Beverly, and he is now receiving our Friday packet as well. Um, but if anyone has any suggestions, please let me know if you think it would be something that would be helpful. I'll be more than happy to, to take care of it. So um, with that, are there any other? Oh, Mrs. Zombie's here. I know she's going. Yeah. I have, do I have a motion to adjourn? This is on. Do I have a second? Mrs. Iacono, all in favor? Aye. Thank you.